Right now, I'd like to introduce uh, just uh, welcoming comments uh, the chairman, uh, the president of the uh, Southwest Impact, Jim Richard. Jim? And thank you all for coming here this morning. It's a wonderful crowd. We're going to have, we've got a full agenda, and I was told to be very brief, and that I shall be too. So I want to thank you all for coming. Yeah, it's an interesting program, and uh, Southwest Impact was very proud to sponsor the breakfast. And I hope everyone uh, had enough, and uh, I know we have a good lunch coming too. So thank you again for all, for coming, and uh, have yeah, a good time. Right now, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, a person that uh, she's involved with everything, and if she doesn't, she creates her own festival. Sharon <laughs> 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 Foley has been very active in this community in a lot of roles, uh, not only at the regional and, and local level, but also at the state level. Uh, she's the, currently the chairperson of the Monroe County Economic Development Congress and Tourism Committee, and has really been the leader of putting this conference together. And uh, as you can tell by the turnout, I think she had a great idea along with the committee to put this thing together. So right now, with a special introduction of another person that's going to be speaking to you, I'd like to bring to the stage Sharon Folsey. Uh, as Steve said, my name is Sharon Folsey, and I'm a supervisor for uh, the 10th District, which is the Town of Leanne home of Gator Fest. So make sure you remember that the last weekend in August. I would like to introduce our County Board Chairman, Bruce Humphrey. Bruce has been a County Board Chair for a short time, but he has done a wonderful job, and we really appreciate He's a person that doesn't like long meetings. So last night, we got done pretty early, almost 11. <laughs> so Bruce Humphrey. Thank you, Sharon. I am Bruce Humphrey. I'm the chair of the Monroe County Board, and I'm here this morning to welcome you to the second annual Monroe County Economic Development Conference, exploring regional economic opportunities, uh, sponsored by the Monroe County Economic Development uh, Commerce and Tourism Committee, of which chair is the chair again, and the International Trade, uh, Business, and Economic Development Council of Southwestern Wisconsin, and we thank you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, the informational exhibitors for being here today, among them uh, Seven Rivers Alliance, uh, Anderson Lutheran, uh, the Sparta and Toma Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Warren's Cranfest, uh, and our friends at Fort McCoy, and many others. Uh, Colonel Nod is on the program uh, later today, and I'm sure he'll be uh, discussing the the now infamous sequester, which is scheduled to uh, kick in tomorrow, and its effects on <clears throat> on the civilian employees at Fort McCoy uh, and and the economy. Uh, we all know what a what a big economic force Fort McCoy is for this area. And I want to uh, say a special thanks to the County Board's Economic Development Committee uh, for your interest and your foresight and all your hard work putting things like these together and doing many other things since uh, you were organized just a, a year or so ago, two years ago maybe. Uh, Sharon Folsey and Najee Van Wyken, uh, Dean Peterson, Jim Rice, and James Schrader. And also thanks to all of those who have agreed to be on the program today. There are many of you, and uh, we're especially appreciative of Governor Walker's willingness to be here later today and to give the keynote. Uh, I spent a lot of years in Madison myself, uh, right across the, uh, the hallway from the governors, and uh, I know that they, they get all kinds of invitations to events like this and they have to choose pretty carefully uh, because they just don't have the time. Uh, they could probably go to a dozen a day, but they can't. So I think it's special that Governor Walker has chosen to come up here today and participate in this event. And uh, we're, again, very appreciative of him uh, doing so. I just have one thought that I want to leave here, and I'll be brief. I got, I got home last night after our five-hour county board meeting and I started sneezing like crazy for some reason. And then I woke up four hours later, I got a runny nose, so I either got a cold on the way or this is some kind of uh, latent allergy to late night long meetings or something. <laughs> My thought is this, uh, I've always been intrigued, and I'm sure many of you have too, uh, the question, why some countries really make it economically and others have struggled, and, and many of them, for just hundreds of years. 
Uh, how do you explain the success of, of, uh, of countries like ours, uh, South Korea and Japan, for, for example, much, much of uh, Europe? And what seems to be the, other, uh, uh, the utter hopelessness and impoverishment of many others, uh, many of them in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, many of them in the Middle East, and much of Central America, for instance. So uh, over the years, I've, I, I'm a book reader, and I've read several books uh, by those who theorize that success or failure is uh, mostly about geography and proximity to bodies of water for transportation. Others say it's climate, uh, whether you're tropical or temperate makes a difference. Uh, others say it's culture and uh, some intelligence and even race has been men mentioned as a factor. And there are other, many others, all kinds of theories abound uh, uh, about uh, why some make and others don't. But I've always thought that, you know, I, you know, I shouldn't be second-guessing experts uh, with PhDs and, and, uh, and, and years of research, but I've always thought that there was something missing from these considerations. And I think it's, uh, I think the very important thing missing uh, that they don't mention is liberty, uh, freedom, uh, not being arbitrarily excluded from participation in a function by those more powerful than you are or not being under someone else's thumb, something that, this is really fundamental, I think, and probably has to be the cornerstone of any successful uh, economy. So my interest was peaked recently, a couple months ago, I was reading a, a book review about another one of these books, uh, and it was written by economists Darren uh, uh, Semaglu and James Robertson, they're both from the East Coast, and the title of their book was why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power and Prosperity and Poverty. And their theory is that man-made political and economic institutions underlie economic success or lack of it. And what they call inclusive political institutions are the basis of it all. First, you, have, you need a centralized state that establishes law and order. And you have to have the rule of law. And you have to have a free and open press, and you have to have the ability of everyone in your society to participate in political life, voting, and all the rest of it. Now, countries that have in what they call inclusive political institutions are mo mo most likely then to also have inclusive economic institutions in which each is free to participate to his or her ability. You have to have fair regulations, you have to have regulations, uh, you can't have uh, uh, monopolies, and you need free trade, and all the rest of that. And uh, in, a, in common to both, uh, both is the ready acceptance, they say, of creative destruction. That is, new ideas freely entering both political and economic marketplaces, accepted or rejected on merit, not somebody's or some group's whim. Uh, the nations that don't make it, on the other hand, have long histories of what they call extractive political and economic institutions. They call it extractive rather than exclusionary, but uh, it means the same thing. And they note that these extractive political institutions lead to extractive economic institutions, which enrich a few at the expense of many. Uh, always. Uh, and Countries like Afghanistan and Haiti are, are prominent among those. Uh, another example until recently has been China, uh, in, which is now a country with a, a very exclusionary political institutions. There's no participation by anybody in political life over there except uh, what remains of what they call the Communist Party. And uh, what appear to be, uh, they have more uh, open economic institutions but in reality, they are still closely uh, controlled by the, uh, by the state. And because of this, they expect China, uh, just like the Soviet Union did years ago, to hit the wall. And, uh, and uh, they don't say cease to be an economic force, but uh, uh, they will be, be diminished. So anyway, that's my thought. 
many reviewers said this book, uh, anyone interested in economic development needs to read this book. So again, it's why nations fail, and uh, uh, at least take the time to Google it, check it out, see what you think of it. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much again for coming. Uh, just give you a brief background of what this economic development uh, Congress and Tourism Committee has done. Last year, right after the conference, we got together and talked about we needed a website, and I was lucky enough to design a website for them. And it's been an ongoing project with everything. Now we're doing videos. We've got an economic development coordinator position that's going to be filling uh, in the next few months. So this committee is really moving forward at a very fast pace with things. And uh, it's, it's a great benefit, not just for the county, but also the individual cities and villages in this, in this county. Uh, the videos that you're going to see here, and, and for the most part, yes, Sharon's right. I'm the only one that's really seen it along with Will. But, uh, uh, it's a two-part video. The first video that you'll be watching is about the infrastructure that's available in uh, Monroe County. And I think we all take for granted we've got all these highways and roadways and everything, but I don't think you realize how networked we really are when it comes to the infrastructure here in Monroe County for business and industry. So that'll be the first video, and Will, you want to get started? When a business or industry is looking at relocating or expanding their company, there is always a high value placed on transportation. Monroe County has a very impressive highway transportation system. Interstate 90 and Interstate When a business or industry is looking at relocating or expanding their company, there is always a high value placed on transportation. Monroe County has a very impressive highway transportation system. Interstate 90 and Interstate 94 runs through our county and intersects on the eastern side. The key part of the interstate system is the numerous interchanges throughout the county, making it very easy to get on and off the interstate anywhere in Monroe County. We also have U.S. Highway 12 and many state highways running throughout the county. You truly have many highway options when transporting your products throughout the Midwest from Monroe County. Along with a strong highway system, the proximity to many major metropolitan cities is also a valuable asset in Monroe County. We are 28 miles from La Crosse, Wisconsin, 192 miles from Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, 255 miles from Chicago, Illinois. 94 miles from Rochester, Minnesota, 178 miles from Green Bay, Wisconsin, 183 miles from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and 293 miles from Des Moines, Iowa. With the majority of the travel to these metropolitan areas based on utilizing the interstate, the distances are very attractive to potential businesses and industries. Monroe County offers full rail service through Canadian Pacific Railways and Union Pacific Railways. Rail is easy to use, efficient, and good for the environment. You can use their intermodal containers, their transload facilities, or their rail cars to ship your goods. Monroe County offers bus transportation. While Greyhound is well known for its regularly scheduled passenger service, the company also provides a number of other services for its customers. Greyhound Package Express Service offers value price same day or early next day package delivery to thousands of destinations. And the company's Greyhound Travel Services Unit offers charter packages for businesses, conventions, schools, and other groups at competitive rates. Monroe County has two airports, with the Sparta Fort McCoy Airport providing local service and the capabilities of landing commercial jets. The Bloyer Field Airport in Toma is a smaller airport, but can handle regular small charter business jet traffic. The large commercial regularly scheduled air passenger service is at the La Crosse Municipal Airport, which is just 30 miles away, right off Interstate 90. One mode of transportation that has been somewhat of an unknown commodity is barges. Some companies are now starting to look at the barge services on the Mississippi River. Monroe County is only 30 miles away from the Mississippi River, and with easy interstate access, you could utilize barges to transport your products. Monroe County is truly rich in transportation options for any business or industry. 
The location of the county to major metropolitan cities, along with a strong transportation system, makes Monroe County a very attractive location for business relocation and or expansion. Hi, I'm Jeannie Barr. Northern Engraving has been in business for over 100 years. We provide automotive interior trim parts and nameplates to over 2,000 customers worldwide. Monroe County has been called home to our corporate office and our Sparta facility since 1958. Our Sparta facility is located close to the interstate and the highway systems, which allows us easy access for our incoming and outbound shipments. One of the major reasons why we are in Monroe County is because of the workforce. We've been very fortunate to have employees with an average length of employment of 11 years for our factory workforce and 24 years for our salaried workforce. Recently, we've just had two of our employees celebrate 50 years of employment at our company. Without their hard work and dedication, Northern would not be where they are today. Hello, I'm Tom Moskowski, the president of Century Foods International, Sparta, Wisconsin. Century Foods was founded in Sparta in 1991 as a dairy commodity trading company. Uh, since then, uh, we've built four facilities in Sparta to add value to the commodities that we traded. Uh, we are one of the leading contract manufacturers in the ready-to-drink, cheese, sports nutrition, and food industries. We have roughly 450 employees and we serve customers in over 45 countries around the world. Monroe County has been a great fit for Century Foods. Uh, many members of our management team grew up on dairy farms and really understand this area. The hardworking people they call Monroe County home have been a key reason that Century Foods is one of the leading contract manufacturers in the sports nutrition and food industries. I'm John Testman, Vice President of Bandbox Cleaners and Laundry. Since 1956, Bandbox has been a fixture in Monroe County. Bandbox provides dry cleaning, rental garments, and healthcare linen service throughout the state of Wisconsin. Easy access to the interstate system and the area's commitment to infrastructure have stimulated our growth and the ability to reach out to our customers. We like it here. Stop in and see what we're all about. My name is Mike Arns. I'm the owner of Arns Shoes and Formal Wear in Sparta, Wisconsin. Uh, we've been in business in Sparta since the late 20s, 1929. Uh, uh, originally the store started in La Crosse, over in La Crosse County, and the first expansion of that store was in Sparta in 1929. We've been doing business there ever since. We've developed uh, real good relationships over the years with uh, quite a number of different industries in the Monroe County area. Uh, they seem to uh, like the way that uh, we're able to help them, and we certainly enjoy helping them. We get to meet new customers and uh, they get to have suppliers take care of them in a local uh, environment which helps everybody in the community. I am the fifth generation in the shoe store and I do believe that we've probably done business with four or five generations of the same families. Uh, they continue to work hard in uh, Monroe County as do we. So together I think we can make uh, and have made Monroe County a much better place to live over the years. Hi, I'm John Cress. I'm the president and owner of Wesco Home Furnishings in Sparta. We started in 1923. Uh, my grandfather and his wife Laura started the business. Back in those days we sold uh, everything from coal to groceries to farm equipment. In the 60s and 70s we were in the kitchen cabinet, the plumbing and heating business, and we've just adapted to uh, uh, cut trends and competition and uh, to our current state, uh, which is basically uh, home furnishings, furniture appliances, and floor companies. My two brothers and myself uh, came in after graduation from college, and I've been there for 40-some years. I have a son-in-law currently in the business, uh, I have a granddaughter who thinks she wants to be. We've had uh, very little turnover. Uh, they're skilled people, a lot of people have been there 10 to 20 years, and uh, that's a huge asset. Um, dealing with our customer base uh, and our success. I think Monroe County is a great place to do business, raise a family, enjoy the small town community life that is afforded in this area. Hi, my name is Mark Rose. I'm with the Toma Cash Mercantile Company out of Toma. 
Uh, we own a department store that's been around since 1900. My brother and I are fourth generation owners along with our wives. We carry men's, women's, children's clothing, shoes, gifts, and furniture. One of the reasons I think we've been successful through the years is our location. Uh, when we first started, it was the rail system, and as the interstate expanded, it became I-90 and 94 divided here. Uh, we feel we've had a good group of tourism and manufacturing that's allowed us to be successful. Another reason I feel we've been successful through the years is our diversification in our product line and in the departments we offer throughout the store. We've always tried to have the newest and updated product lines and we try to keep our prices very competitive. In the 1900s, our main focus was on groceries for all the farmers to bring in their crops. Uh, that's how we became known as the Toma Cash Mercantile. And as the years have progressed, we've evolved into more of a clothing store, uh, shoes, gifts, furniture, and the surrounding community in Toma has always been a vital part of our success. I'm Vic Bernstead, second generation from Bernstead Brothers. Hi, I'm Ken Bernstead, president of Bernstead's Market and a third generation. I'm Derek Bernstead with Bernstead's Market, company vice president and fourth generation. We started in 1944, my mother and dad buying the Southside grocery and from that point on my brother and I continued to grow and we went into the uh, eastern part of the city to uh, increase the size of our store. We really felt that the interstate was going to be a big help in expanding our business. We'd like to thank the people of the Tome area in Monroe County who have contributed our success. Uh, the location in Tome has been ideal for us with uh, being next to the interstate and uh, the workforce and all the people in this area have been real positive and instrumental in our success. It's been our company mission to give back to the communities that we're involved in, such as Chasing Daylight Animal Shelter, the local food pantries, the Boys and Girls Club, and the Burnsheds Market Christmas in July Foundation, just to name a few. And today, the second generation is probably the, the best you can get by, but we are a fourth looking for a fifth. And uh, we hope that we can continue doing this for another 69 years as a company. on how these videos go. You got to see kind of the whole thing. Uh, the first one, of course, is, is intact. That's going to be shown for infrastructure uh, uh, requests. But the second part, a lot of times when people do videos, they do it, and after they get done, they think they need to do another video, and they got to reinvent themselves and start from scratch again. Each of those is its own pod. So we can take the retail side of things and add other retailers together and make a retail video. We can also do the same thing for, for the industrial side. And, and the nice thing about it is we want to show the heritage, as you can see, multi-generations of people that have had very successful businesses that have gone through the tough times that have reinvented themselves and been successful. So what we wanted to do was have that come through. The Monroe County is not just a great place to live and work and play, but it's also a place that you, when you do set roots down and you are real dedicated with your business, you have a chance to have it for a long, long time. So we're really excited about what we're going to be able to do with this video. We're going to have it on flash drives that we'll be sending out especially with the new economic development coordinator to use. But we're also going to have it on our website at gomonroecountywy.com where people can uh, watch the videos as well. So thanks to Image uh, Media out of Toma. We stayed local. Uh, they were the ones that produced the video. And I know the committee's really excited now that they've actually seen the video. <laughs> that we've got some fun things to do with them in the future. So thanks for everybody that had the input on it. And you might recognize some of the stars of the show out in the audience today. So you can tell them what a great job they did. Right now, we're going to move on because I know the clock is ticking and we want to keep things on track. I'd like to introduce uh, uh, another member of the uh, committee and also a county board member. Uh, I can't believe she's here because she's so darn busy. To show you how busy she is, I was at a meeting one time and I saw this calendar sitting on the table and it had every county and state and local meeting in it. And I'm going, wow, I wonder what's the department at the state level put something like that together. And then they told me it was Najee's daytimer. <laughs> So, she's a busy lady, but we're glad that she's part of our committee and a big asset to Monroe County. I'd like to introduce our county board supervisor, Najee Van Wyken. Thank you, Steve, very much. It gives me a great deal of pleasure today and an honor to introduce our uh, secretary of uh, tourism in the state. Usually when I give introductions, I just uh, go with what I know about the person. 
But I was given this uh, brief intro, and as I read it, I thought I cannot pass this chance by to share it with all of you because it is so spectacular. And then at the end, I'll do my little personal intro. <laughs> but Stephanie Klatt has been traveling Wisconsin nonstop for the past two decades, logging more than one million miles crisscrossing the state. Few people know more about Wisconsin's 72 counties and the fun, historic, spiritual, wild, romantic, and, and adventurous attractions and events that they offer. Stephanie comes to the Wisconsin Department of Tourism after a 19-year career with Discover Wisconsin Television and Radio. There she traveled 200 days a year, hosting the award-winning travelogue series while also researching and writing over 4,000 radio programs about the state. She was also managing, managing director of the uh, Discover Wisconsin Media Network, which included branding, public relations efforts, and marketing promotions. In 2010, after six Emmy nominations from the Chicago Midwest chapter of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Clett uh, finally brought the gold uh, statue back home to Wisconsin in the category of individual excellence for on-camera hosting. At last, no more Susan Lucci jokes. <laughs> Clett is passionate about Governor Scott Walker's vision for creating 250,000 jobs and believes Wisconsin tourism will have a big part in that effort. Stephanie also understands the power of partnerships, shining the light on Wisconsin's hidden and lesser known treasures, and working with the dynamic tourism related organizations around the state. I just felt that being such important matters like this, it should be shared with all of you today. When we first started planning the second annual uh, convention here, my first thought was we have to start out the morning's program with a dynamic enthusiasm, uh, spark, spark plug and fireworks person. And it was a very easy choice for me to suggest Stephanie Klett. I've worked with Stephanie for many, many years. She does a wonderful job, but what I think is most meaningful for me is that she is so personable to everyone she meets. And we always share a big hug when we see each other. And we know in our communities what she offers to the whole state of Wisconsin. So without further ado, she is going to tell us this morning how tourism is uh, an economic driver for the state. And so we are very fortunate today to have Stephanie come and she comes directly from the White House. Maybe she can share that story with you. Yeah. Let's welcome Stephanie. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and what a pleasure to be here. Nancy, thank you for that introduction, and the sentiments are returned. But, but there was one thing you forgot to tell everybody, and that is that in 1999, while filming in Monroe County, right here in Sparta, I was, the 1999, celebrity cow milking butterfest champion right here. And I still have that cow trophy in my office. I knew I was gonna be last place, so I decided if I was gonna be last, I was gonna look the best. So I wore a bright fluorescent pink dress and a big old hat, and I ended up winning it. But while I was milking that cow, all I could think of is the udders are so dry, would someone put some lotion on these udders? <laughs> so um, I want to si say hi also to my friend, Colonel Ray Bolin. Colonel Bolin, where are you sitting? Right over here. Um, many years ago, I had met Cur Colonel Bolin uh, in the capacity of Discover Wisconsin. We were doing a documentary on World War II hero, Major Richard Ira Baum, the number one fighter pilot of all time. So I needed access to some archives in the Pentagon and Colonel Bolin at that time was Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, so he flew me out and brought me to the Pentagon and introduced me to a lot of big players. 
And you know, everyone was introducing themselves as captain and colonel. So when it was my turn, I said, I'm General Clack. Well, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I learned very quickly, you don't do that out at the Pentagon. So uh, Colonel Bullen said that his verdict was out on me until he saw the final product, and uh, then it was all good. But um, I, last but not least, I do want to thank my friends from the Lawrence Cranberry Festival and Heidi Greg Smith from Discover Wisconsin. Um, the very last episode I, I did for uh, Discover Wisconsin was on the Warren's Cranberry Festival, and it was just a coincidence. I didn't know it was going to be my last show. I didn't know, I didn't have the foggiest idea I would be selected for this position. And um, the last show I ever did ended up being Emmy nominated, but when we had the premiere party in Warren's, uh, they had taken time that they bought. You know, it's a, it's a paid for show. And they did uh, a tribute to my 19 years in, in television. And it's not often in life that we're genuinely surprised by something that's just really, really kind. And so I will take that with me forever. So thank you very much. Um, it has been a great year for Wisconsin tourism. Uh, close by the Great River Road was just voted the most scenic, pretty drive in the United States, beating out California and beating out Hawaii. That's huge. Um, Racine's North Beach, Racine, Wisconsin, their beach, which was certified one of two clean beaches on the Great Lakes, was just voted one of America's top 51 beaches by <laughs> USA Today. Green Bay, of course, was named best NFL town in the United States. Yes! Yeah. Woo oh, and I forgot to introduce my boyfriend, Jordy Nelson, if you haven't been over there. I have a little story about Jordy Nelson because we just used him in a television commercial that I'll be telling you about. Um, Madison was named best college football town in the United States. So it was a great year for Wisconsin. Um, there were probably about another 100 awards, which in a few weeks we're going to talk about at the Governor's Conference on Tourism that we're having this year in Madison. But the Department of Tourism had a fantastic year. Um, we, we earned six Wisconsin uh, Paragon Awards for Public Relations. We won three International Marcom Awards. Um, we won a couple awards for a social media campaign. And the big one for us was winning two PR Platinum Awards out in New York City. And why this was a big deal is it wasn't just tourism, it was all companies that market. So winners included McDonald's, American Airlines, Disney, and the Wisconsin Department of Tourism. So we were pretty stunned. Tourism is not a frivolous industry. A lot of times because we're in an area where you get to have some fun and excitement, um, it's easy to look at us as frivolous. So at the Department of Tourism, we are showing our results to our legislators and what a powerhouse and economic generator tourism is. In 2011, travel expenditures in Wisconsin were $16 billion. That was up $1.2 billion from the year before. And our 2012 numbers will be coming out um, the, the first week of May, which is National Tourism Week. But right now, we're already getting preliminary information in. We've learned a few things. In 2012, we had more vacationers. They stayed longer. And we had a return on investment of 6 to 1. So what that means is every dollar that we were given to market Wisconsin as the destination to go to in the United States we got $6 back for state and local taxes. And what that meant is in 2011, state and local taxes from travel industry here in our state were $1.3 billion, plus another $800 million for federal taxes. So you're looking at over $2 billion. Now, that money is used for schools. It's used for roads. It's used for fire. And it's used for police protection. Would they miss that $1.3 billion if we didn't exist as an industry, you bet they would. As an industry, we're two and a half times larger than the auto manufacturing industry, only our jobs can't be outsourced like those in manufacturing. You know, many years ago, especially in the legislature, there was a Rodney Dangerfield, you know, kind of like no respect. Uh, tourism will just always be there, and that's not the truth. It'll be there if you take care of it. But um, times have changed. And I really like what Travel Weekly said not too long ago. They said, Rodney Dangerfield is retired. Ben Bernanke said that tourism has been the bright spot of our economy and recovery. And tourism is not about dead end, minimum wage only jobs. We have a longevity that other industries don't have. And we have a mirror to address those who don't have jobs. And we can help them go from hourly 
to a career. We're a darling for hiring and we can train them. Because of travel, there are 14.1 million jobs in the United States. And here in Wisconsin, there are 181,000 people employed full time because of tourism in Wisconsin. We are a force. Now in 2011, I love these numbers. Monroe County stepped up in a big way. Um, your travel expenditures were up 20.86% to 71 million. That's incredible. There were only two other counties that hit the twos, that hit a 20% increase. That's phenomenal. Nearby La Crosse County, travel expenditures were up 6.5% to $193.7 million. Trumpelo County was up 3.25%. Vernon County up 4.12%. Crawford County was up 12.71%. Grant County was up. Green County was up. Iowa County was up. Lafayette County was up. Well, you get, you get the picture. Tourism is critical in Wisconsin, and in particular to Southwest Wisconsin. So here at the Wisconsin Department of Tourism, we exist by statute to market Wisconsin. So here's what we're doing and why. Um, the number one thing we needed to do was create some outstanding marketing. Okay, that, that sounds kind of funny because that's what we do you know, by statute. But the reason we needed to do that is two years ago when I came aboard, the Department of Tourism had five slogans in 15 years. You remember your Among Friends, Escape to Wisconsin, Life So Good, Live Like You Mean It, Stay a Little Bit Longer. Five slogans in 15 years. Our state was overly branded. You know, I love New York because I've always been, I love New York. Great faces, great places, South Dakota. So what we did is we decided, why do we need a slogan at all? We have a great state. Let's create marketing, television spots, radio, print, social media, based on the number one travel motivator. And the number one travel motivator, when I found this out through a research company, I almost wanted my money back because it's so obvious. Number one travel motivator is fun. People want to have fun. The, the, the third reason people travel is they have to visit family and friends. Number two, they want rest and relaxation. That's what the Pure Michigan campaign is based on. But the number one reason they travel is fun. So what we did is we created commercials that when you see them, you go, I have to do that. I have to go there. And so what we did is we started using some Wisconsin celebrities. Now, we don't want to go overboard like California because the star of our state are the people and our natural resources. But you know what? We have a sense of humor. So we wanted kind of a wink and a smile. So the very first commercial we launched starred Henry Winkler. And it's, a, it's this couple going downtown Milwaukee, and they're having this big urban experience, and you see them having their picture taken by the bronze Fawn statue. And when it pulls out the camera, you see the person taking the picture is Henry Winkler. So it got a huge response. We paid $15,000 for Henry Winkler to work half a day. Now normally, how would that be being good stewards of our taxpayer dollar? Our earned media, because the story was picked up by the wire, which we knew it would be, was just over $10 million. So we've been leveraging our Wisconsin celebrities or celebrities that have a tie. Tony Shalhoub, if you remember him from Monk, does everyone, anyone here remember? Okay, Tony Shalhoub, uh, he's been in a ton of movies. Um, he's from Green Bay. He's won four National Emmy Awards. And if, uh, because it took me 19 years to win an Emmy Award, um, and in mine was just a regional one, uh, when I met him in Spring Green, uh, I brought my Emmy with me. And so uh, he comes in, and he just flown in from L.A., and he sees my Emmy, and the first thing he said is, oh, so that's what the little ones look like. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, he, he did a great job, and then we used Jordy Nelson. And this was incredible. This is one of the things we've been doing. If you've ever heard of David Zucker or Jerry Zucker, they wrote the airplane movies and Naked Gun. And what's interesting is David Zucker is uh, a really a conservative guy. He loves Governor Walker. His brother Jerry, opposite end. You know, totally very liberal, very democratic. Well, we're tourism. Everybody is invited to this table. So um, we had David Zucker produce a commercial using Robert Hayes. And we had Jerry Zucker just do a commercial that will launch this fall with Jordy Nelson. And I have to tell you, um, he couldn't be a nicer guy. Uh, it was supposed to be the perfect fall day for our filming. And it was the perfect fall day.
the day before the shoot. The day we filmed, it was 49 degrees, freezing rain. We had Jordy for a day and we had Jerry Zucker for a day, that was it. They were made, able to make it look spectacular. But Jordy had to be outside for 11 hours. And because it was so cold, you could see his breath. So he had to suck on ice cubes all day because it's a TV trick that'll take the breath away. So um, he's getting rained on, but he was wearing that exact jersey. And um, uh, being single, I couldn't help but notice he's really built. <laughs> and it was raining on him and his skin was all shiny. Oh my gosh, it was the greatest day of my life. But um, the commercial is a, kind of a spoof on The Wizard of Oz because he's from Kansas. And what I like is in the commercial, he's playing catch with his real wife. Uh, they were high school sweethearts in Kansas. And um, he is really an exceptional person, but I can't wait for you to see that commercial. But again, we really leveraged our celebrities and got a, a few million dollars more pre uh, of press just by using David Zucker and by using Jordy Nelson. So outstanding marketing. Um, the second thing we needed to do was increase funding for marketing. Now, you know, what organization doesn't want more money? But here was our challenge. In the last few years, uh, when I first came aboard, Wisconsin's marketing budget was $9.9 .9 million. One 30-second spot for the Super Bowl, one 30-second spot is just over $4 million. So you've got $9.9 .9 million. Well, you can still work that with some partnerships, but Pure Michigan's budget was $33 million. The state of Illinois was $44 million. So I went in front of the Joint Committee on Finance, Governor Walker, who I'm so glad is speaking to you at lunch. He gets tourism. He understands economic development and what tourism does for that. So I went in front and under you know, the governor's orders, he said, you know, we're gonna try to get two and a half million dollars more the first year and another two and a half million the second. And so I had the pleasure of testifying for the Joint Committee on Finance in the third month on the job, and um, we ended up getting that money. So we're up to 12 and a half million dollars a year. We're still you know, really behind our states. So what do we do? We create more partnerships. Um, we went to the Marcus Corporation. They own 450 screens. Well, David Zucker is producing these 60 second spots for us. He's a Hollywood producer with Wisconsin ties. Could you air these during your movie previews because they're that good? He said, sure. That was a $100,000 deal he gave us and it took 10 seconds to seal it. We went to Southwest Airlines and we said, we need a sponsor so we can fly in travel reporters to show the best <coughs> travel reporters from around the world. Or if a community like somebody here in Monroe County says, we want a wine and dine travel writer, but we don't have the money, we can give you a ticket that will get them here. They said, absolutely, we'll do it. We went to the Packers and we went to the Brewers and we just negotiated a deal with the Brewers that TravelWisconsin.com is the sole sponsor of their after show, all, all the games. We worked with them, told them this is good for the state. They basically reduced their price 80%. So that's what we're doing, creating these kind of partnerships that are working for everybody. And what that is, is really our, our third thing we needed to do, and that's increasing earned media. Earned media is just a fancy way of saying free press. So we did something called a Geiger tour. We brought in 100 of the best travel writers around the world to Wisconsin. We brought them through Southwest Wisconsin on the Great River Road. We took them north to Eagle River and Minocqua, Mid-State, Door County, all over. They did articles that we could never buy. We had full page articles in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune. Our earned media this past year was $60 million. So now you take that $60 million, with the stepped up increase we got under Governor Walker at $12.5 million, and we are winning the game. So that's really been our strategy. Um, another thing, in economic development, there's got to be a lot of accountability. And Governor Walker has given us this. You know, I, I only have a private sector background, just two years in public service. So um, what I was proud of is the you know, first thing we did with, as a team at the department is came up with a four-year strategic plan. Well, our governor had cabinet meetings with us um, every week. And he said, I'm gonna expect DNR, you work with tourism because aquatic invasive species or land invasive species, that's not just a DNR issue, that's a tourism issue. Transportation issues, that's a tourism issue. If our travelers are bottled up in Beloit, which is my hometown, and on a Sunday and a Friday, you should see the traffic, it goes back for hours. Um, that's a tourism problem. 
So he said, I have an expectation that you're gonna to work together. We're gonna to meet every week as a cabinet, and then it became every other week. So we meet as a group, and the governor is there. And then once a month, we have 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one with him to tell him everything that we've done um, and achieved. And we have to submit weekly reports. So um, literally, we finish our four-year strate strategic plan um, the first year, and then we did it again the second year. And I think the reason is, when you're sitting five feet from the governor, you don't want to be like, yeah, governor, I didn't really get to it this week. You can't do that. <laughs> it's accountability. And uh, he expects it. And he's extremely gracious. When you make that achievement, he'll say, nice job, what's next? You're like, mm, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Next, I just want to talk briefly about international tourism because your county uh, chair had, had brought up different countries and China has been such a big deal for so long. And I wish Wisconsin were better placed right now for the Chinese market. You know, by 2015, they're expecting 274 million Chinese visitors somewhere outside of their country. And right now in the United States, the Chinese visitor spends twice as much as our top European visitor. They spend about $7,000 a week. So can you imagine that kind of revenue? But the Chinese visitor is extremely discriminating. So the first thing is they want to go to an area that has a Chinatown. And you can ask just about any Chinese resident. Name the Chinatowns in the United States. Name, name them in England, and they will. They'll know old Miami and Chicago and Philadelphia and New York. That's where they want to go. Second, they tend to travel in very large groups. When they check into their hotel, they want free stuff. They want the free robe, they want the free drink tickets, they want a two-for-one special, whatever it is. That's culture. They're culturally, they expect that sort of thing. Um, they don't want forced shopping. If you take them to tour something and they're forced to shop afterwards, they're offended. They want a guide that is fluent, you know, bilingual uh, in Mandarin. And in, in Wisconsin, that's a little bit of a challenge with uh, bilingual interpreters. And also, they want one authentic Chinese meal a day. They're willing to experiment. You know, they'll, they'll try American food, but they want one authentic Chinese meal a day. Usually they want it for breakfast. They call it kanji. They don't like cold food. They like hot food. So um, our state really isn't positioned right now uh, for that market. So what are we positioned for internationally? Well, Sarah Clavis, who is with me today from the Wisconsin Department of Tourism, Sarah, if you wave, many of you here know her. She is uh, just an absolute delight and a, a credit to public service. But um, you know, look at that's a, like a little pageant wave. Hey, Miss Sparta, what's up? <laughs> um, but Sarah has organized for the first time in over a decade an international committee of leaders in tourism from the top of the state to the bottom of the state, and they've been meeting. Well, what also happened, and you might remember this, about four or five years ago when the economy was really tanking, President Obama said, you know, hey, government workers, no more meetings and convention travels. And businesses, you gotta, you know, lock down and save your money. Stop that traveling. Well, they did. And tourism was slammed. So much so that President Obama said, this isn't good. And Congress passed and the president signed for the first time ever the Brand USA Initiative. And what that is, is it's basically saying for the first time in decades, we're gonna market the United States around the world as a premier travel destination. Well, haven't we been doing that? No, um, only a few places have been doing it. And so this Brand USA, before they started their advertising campaign, like any good company, said we need to do some research. So what does the rest of the world really think of America as a vacation destination? Well, here's what they found. Number one, the global traveler found the United States as too familiar. You know, you see as a country, we haven't been united in advertising. So for years, New York, California, Florida, and of course Disney have been doing all the advertising for the United States. So for them, if they've done Disney and they've done those states, you've seen America. There's nothing more to see. Number two, as a tourism destination, the United States is middle-aged. Kind of like driving your father's Cadillac, which my dad drives a Cadillac and I think it's cool. But um, we've got good messaging, but for years, it's been the same messaging. 
Come here. Come stay with us. There's nothing fresh. Number three, and this is a big one. The perception of the United States was one of being brash and arrogant. Is it any wonder with television shows like The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and Jersey Shore? People think that. And number four, they think that the United States is unwelcoming. Now, why would they think that when it takes, on average, three months for a visa interview, and when they come here, they are immediately fingerprinted and photographed? After all this research, Brand USA came up with a slogan, Land of Dreams. And because despite the four things their research you know, just pointed out, people around the world still think of America as a place where dreams really do come true. And that's a cool thing. When they aired their new commercial in the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan, the results were phenomenal. So much so that Canada was a little scared because they have a small media market and the ad was dominating their airwaves. But um, Canada's quick on their feet, so they started promoting two nation vacations, flying to Canada and taking an Alaskan cruise. And as America promotes more outside of North America, Canada is billing itself as a cherry on top of the American Sunday. So what should you like about travel if you are the boss in a company? You know, don't you want your employees to stay put? Uh, travel is critical. And it's critical for a lot of reasons. One, if you're in the travel industry, you know, Americans, we lose millions and millions of vacation days. One, people are afraid if they leave, they'll be replaced. Or they're afraid that if they leave, when they come back, they are gonna be so far behind, they will never catch up. But travel benefits everyone. Um, travel increases business productivity, and creativity. When a person takes a walk on the beach or hikes a mountain, the ideas start flowing. You never hear anyone say, well, I was in my cubicle and I had the greatest idea. <laughs> but send a person on vacation and see what happens. You've heard of the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, there are four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and roaming. Don't let the world pass you by. Um, the Department of Tourism uh, is, is really on a mission as this next budget goes through. Uh, I know I just got my testimony date again for the Joint Committee on Finance, but the governor is recommend, recommending about a $500,000 increase with money going to international tourism, meetings and conventions, and sports travel. What we learned during the recession is that people love their sports. You know, if you're gonna do the Elroy Crazy Legs run, you're gonna do it. And um, all around the country during the recession, sports marketing never went down, and that was state to state. It either stayed level or it went up. So that's a great new market. And meetings and conventions, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And Wisconsin offers really unique things, different than other states, that can bring them in. The governor is also offering an opportunity, if it passes, that our lapse money of $1.3 million, that we get to keep that. And lapses aren't something before I went to government, I even knew what a lapse was. So just because they give you a budget of $12.5 million doesn't mean that's really the budget you get. Because if some other department or the Department of Administration needs more money, people have to lapse it. So right away we had lapse money taken off. He said no one is touching tourism's money. It's there to market Wisconsin. So it has been an incredible, incredible year. But um, I did fly in from Washington, D.C., where I was with Governor Walker and his wife for the National Governors Association. Um, I have to tell you that Governor Pat Quinn from Illinois is the worst eater I've ever seen. <laughs> we had a big Wisconsin booth, and we were serving Danish Pringles, and we had, it was funny, we didn't have craisins, and people asked if we had craisins. We were serving, serving custard and Sprecher root beer, um, artisan cheese. He came to our booth and started talking. He was very friendly. And so he was eating a cracker, and you know, and the cheese was flying out, and I was literally kind of doing this thing. And I thought, is he kidding? No, he just kept grabbing more cheese and spitting it out. So he was giving all this advice for me, me to pass on to Governor Walker, including how we need to train. And you know, I represent Wisconsin, so I, I couldn't say what I was really thinking, but um, I think the state is bankrupt, and maybe you want to worry about your own state for a while. So um, 
Uh, right after he, he left, uh, Jerry Brown, the governor of California, was there. And um, he kept staring at the food. Well, he's really skinny now. And I said, well, can I, I'm happy to get you something. What can I get you? And he said, I'm on a diet. <laughs> and so he just kept staring at it. But um, the first lady and I had the opportunity to address all the first ladies and gentlemen um, uh, for about 15 minutes to invite them to Wisconsin. Because this summer in August is the National Governors Association big annual meeting, and it's being held for the first time in years in Milwaukee. So um, she kind of pitched it, and then I told them some fun stories about Wisconsin and some of the neat stuff and the historical stuff. And when it was over, the First Lady of Arkansas said, you're way better than my tourism secretary. He's boring. <laughs> I like you, Arkansas. But um, you know, I had to tell them all the usual stories, the Wood Tick Festival and the uh, Melvina Frog, Leap, Frog Days, and, um, and they loved it. But one of the stories I ended with was about you know this year of the veteran that Governor, Governor Walker declared 2012 is the year of the veteran. And this weekend, it's coming to a close in Milwaukee. And one of my nine brothers is actually a professional comedian, so he's doing a big show, and all the proceeds will better um, benefit the Milwaukee, the, the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation. So, um, you know, it's amazing. Just four days ago was the 68th anniversary of that planting of the flag on Iwo Jima, that famous photo that became a sculpture. You know, and one of those folks was Doc Bradley from Anago, Wisconsin. You know, and when he passed away. Many of his relatives and friends never knew that was him. He never talked about it. You know, and having Major Richard Ira Bong, you know, the number one fight, fighter pilot of all time, you know, from Wisconsin. Bob Hope and Bing Crosby asked for his autograph. And then having Colonel Mitchell Red Cloud, the first Ho-Chunk Congressional Medal of Honor recipient ever. What an impressive state we live in. You know, we have so much to be proud of. Every day people focus about all the bad things going on and the sequester and how people don't get along. And every single day, tourism is the one thing that brings families together. It brings people with different political differences together. We can all agree on pie and a great restaurant and a great vacation destination. And that's something all of us in the industry can be proud of, topped with the fact that we're a $16 billion powerhouse. So thank you very much for your time today. I uh, really, really appreciate being invited here to uh, what feels like a home away from home. Thank you.